Welcome everyone to another edition of the Beyond the Red Bricks podcast. Today we have with us Senthil Govindan, CEO and founder of DataWorks and PGPX class of 2009. Senthil has a bachelor's in electronics and instrumentation engineering followed by a master's in management information systems from the University of Arizona prior to his time at IIM Ahmedabad. He has worked across areas like technology consulting, B2B marketing and advertising across companies like i2, Oracle, IBM and Ozone Media. Prior to starting DataWorks, Senthil comes with extensive international work experience, having previously worked in the US, Japan, and Australia before his homecoming with the PGPX at IMA. Welcome, Senthil, to our podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, so we'll just get the ball rolling right now. Uh, so, Senthil, uh, can you give us a little description or just a brief about your current venture and what kind of initiatives you lead at DataWorks right now? Sure. So at DataWorks, what we're really trying to do is is help clients in the world of online advertising. Um, so that's really across the board, you know, in areas as uh, diverse or platforms as diverse as uh, Facebook and a Google or a LinkedIn at one end, and uh, kind of the equivalent of open source advertising, uh, which is uh, which is known as programmatic advertising at the other end. So we work with uh, with a Google, um, you know, and Facebook. We have a certain recognized status because of the volume and quality of work we do. And in the open source world of programmatic, um, we have our own technology and tools that we use to help our clients. Uh, my role in uh, DataWorks currently is that of CEO. Um, so it's. In a startup, a CEO basically has to do everything. Um, and as someone once quipped, your primary role is uh, chief psychology officer. So um, it's uh, all the different functions. Need to make sure that I have one eye on each of them. So I have a lot of eyes in my head, as you can probably imagine. And um, I also, you know, obviously need to make sure that the team is together, everyone's motivated, everyone's happy, and moving towards a common goal. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. The chief psychology officer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Senthil, if we, we were to ask, like, uh, why did you? You had already done masters, so why did you choose the program after an extensive work experience? What made you do this, and also how has been your journey post PGPX? Uh, it's a good question and a very long answer. So let me know when you want me to stop. Um, but uh, look, I. I did MIS at the University of Arizona, which has a bit of a reputation as a party school. But uh, one of the lesser known facts is that the MIS program, there is a top three course in the US. Um, and then after that, I got into kind of techno functional consulting where I was working with Fortune 500 firms to help them implement um, uh, software products, right? That um, uh, for the different companies that I was working with, I2 and then Siebel, which got acquired by um, by Oracle. Um, during the course of this journey, I realized that I was doing, uh, if, if uh, it's okay for me to say so myself, I was doing a pretty good job in my role. Um, but I realized over the course of time that I was giving answers to tactical questions. And I was really good at giving answers to tactical questions. <clears throat> What I wanted over the course of time is uh, is to be the person who's asking questions and asking those questions at a more strategic level, right? Uh, some people come from a business family or they just have that general business acumen. Uh, unfortunately, that was not me. And I felt that I really needed to do an MBA in order to uh, make that uh, make that leap. Um, and so I think I was in Australia, uh, in Sydney, managing a few of Oracle's largest, uh, largest clients there. Uh, and I decided, okay, it's time to do an MBA. Uh, at that point of time, I think I was 31. And I figured, look, rather than going and, um, you know, like doing an MBA in various other parts of the world, uh, it's better to, I mean, frankly, I had no uh, professional network in India at that stage because I'd moved out of India as an adolescent. Uh, and so I figured I should come back to India to, uh, to do my MBA and build out the professional network again. Um, and, you know, once that choice was made, then uh, then there really was only one choice remaining, right? I mean, if you're coming back to India, the only place you really want to do an MBA is at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, 
So I applied, thankfully got through, and uh, that's what led me to uh, to join the PGPX program. Um, so that's the first part of the answer. I'm sorry, but I went on so long, I forgot the second part of the question. No worries. Uh, the second part of us, how has been your journey post PGPX and how do you think the program helped you in your uh, post PGPX journey? Got it. So look, with, uh, with PGPX, uh, I mean, so first of all, I mean, I love the program, right? I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, the learning, enjoyed the uh, the peer group, right? Um, enjoyed all the debates in the Cindy rooms, which have no meaning outside that Cindy room in many cases. Um, but uh, I mean, like after graduating from PGPX, one of the things I realized is that the course had really changed my mindset. Uh, I was no longer looking at things from a purely from a qualitative perspective, which is what I was doing before. Um, but I'd learned how to look at things from a data-driven standpoint, right? So, uh, so that's I'd say probably my biggest transition, right? Uh, through uh, having done the PGTX program. The other thing is uh, you learn to stretch yourself, right? You learn how to learn, right? Because uh, if if you're if you have three cases a day and uh, and you're expected to learn something and then get into those cases and then prepare those cases and then come into the core, uh, come into the actual class with a point of view, um, you have essentially been able to figure out how do I quickly distill or find out sources of information, distill that into what I truly need and then apply that information. Um, so that's what I found. I mean, like I moved into a completely different role in um, in uh, B2B marketing with IBM after PGPX. I knew nothing about uh, B2B uh, marketing. I'd never been in a marketing role before, but I adjusted. I figured it out, uh, even in as complex a company as IBM. And, uh, you know, like I was able to function in that uh, role. And then after that, when I decided that it's time to switch over to, to the digital space, I, um, uh, you know, like initially I knew absolutely nothing, like literally zero. And, um, you know, like I was given an opportunity, I joined. And once I did, I, uh, you know, I, I forced myself to read more and more about uh, the industry, right? And, and between that and hands-on experimentation, I was able to grow. Uh, finally, in DataWorks, right? Um, Look, the the profs on campus always keep telling us that PGPX is meant to prepare us for a general management position, and nowhere was this more true than once I started my own company. Right, uh, I had to figure out how to keep a daily ledger. I had to figure out how to, um, you know, like manage the books. I had to figure out how to hire, how to structure the company. Um, you know, what different statutory requirements would be, how to go through contracts. Um, you know, like all of this was part of what I had to take on. And again, that, you know, learning how to learn, uh, you know, that critical skill that I discussed before, that was extremely important. Uh, but also was the fact that I had enough functional knowledge about different areas that I was able to actually perform as a general manager, right? Something that I could have never expected prior to BGPX. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, there was a there was a question that uh, came up, and it's a point of discussion that many alums have also brought up uh, on the podcast or even outside the podcast. So that uh, that question usually ends up being, you know, given that the PGPX is kind of, uh, you know, the experience, the work experience is kind of a, a bit lesser than what it would have been uh, back in uh, your time. Is that a lot of people are coming in with like uh, very technical skills or like you know somewhat less uh, you know a uh, less amount of people management uh, roles prior to coming here and uh, one of the takeaways that a lot of alums have indicated is that when you leave the pgpx program one of the best things you learn is organizational behavior how to deal with people how to you know incentivize motivate or you know get the interpersonal relationships taken care of uh, what would be your take on that hmm. so i mean i can say that uh, and, and you know like this is I think also a little bit of the professional cultural environment, right? So outside of India, in many places, you don't get managerial responsibility until a much later stage of your career. So when I joined PGPX, uh, a lot of my batchmates um, around the same age had already managed teams and I hadn't, 
right? However, I had managed complex situations, right? Where I had responsibility, but I had zero authority, right? So your, your, your soft skills kind of need to flex a little bit more. You're exercising a little bit more so that when you're, when you're faced with the real thing, uh, it becomes a tad easier to, to manage. Um, but what I'd say is that it, you know, like uh, dealing with uh, people management and dealing with uh, how to um, uh, interact with others is eventually, a, uh, you know, it's a process of, of understanding who you're working with, right? So, uh, you know, you can never dictate, right? You need to get buy-in, you need to build consensus, right? And uh, in my view, you know, the best managers, the best leaders, are those who are able to um, who are able to convince everyone around them that there is a certain goal that is worth it for everybody, right? Uh, for the organization, but also as individuals. Um, and so that would be my one key piece of advice, you know, for anybody who's trying to who's now transitioning into a, a people management role or have to you know manage or lead a, a group of people. Um, just you know, like end of the day treat everyone like humans right you know it it so happens that you know for the for the organization to function there might be a hierarchy but if you're able to think past the hierarchy and talk about how uh you can get everyone convinced assuming they're a peer uh, uh, about the right course of action and work towards that and build that consensus that would help you uh, uh, a big deal in um, in actually being able to take on this ob type of uh, skill set Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting insight. Uh, thanks, Anthil. You know, I think after the, the career that you had, uh, one of the questions and I think one of the, the, the biggest uh, things that most people kind of want to do after leaving this place at some point in their life is to do exactly what you did, uh, you know, after an extensive and colored career. So the question that then comes up for a lot of people over here, as well as so quite a few of my current batchmates, uh, and I'm sure the future ones will be coming in a, a few months, is that after a, an extensive career, IBM, Ozone, um, Oracle, and the like, uh, what was that that niche? You know, like when you, when you went out and thought of Dataworks, how did you find that niche out there? And more importantly for us, it's like, what was the trigger you had when you, you, know, when you went out and saw the need for Dataworks to happen? you left behind a much more secure, um, so to speak, career and a traditional career path behind. So what was the spark, you know, that came in your mind and you thought, you know, I need to start something on my own right now. Uh, did you always have Dataworks in the back of your mind or was it a need to be an entrepreneur and then you figured out what, what would happen or has, you know, where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, like a few people have asked me this over the course of time and I always say that I'm something of an accidental entrepreneur, right? So, uh, uh, I mean, like, Honestly, I was a big company person, uh, as you pointed out, you know, like a lot of the organizations that I worked with uh, were fairly large. Um, but what I realized, right, I mean, so first of all, I mean, like in my head, right, when I left PGPX, um, you know, the, and there's always that dichotomy, like, what do you want to do? Yes, I want control and I want to do something new. But, you know, if I go into a large organization, I learn processes and you know I'll, I'll be able to uh, you know like uh, kind of get a footing in my post MBA uh, career um, I had actually talked about it my wife was uh, with me on campus when when I was uh, studying PGPX and I thought about starting uh, uh, starting a company right after PGPX and I was talking to her and as usual my wife is the most seen one between the two of us and she said, look, I was in the place com when I was on campus. And uh, she said, look, I see how much time you're spending on this. And I see how passionate you are about it. Um, if you're going to start a company, I'm sure you're going to spend an equal amount of time. So rather than just going and starting a company for the sake of it, right? Why don't you first figure out what you want to do, right? Once you figure out what you want to do, then you can, you know, think about this. And um, I said, yeah, you know, fair enough. That is obviously the same uh, same course of action. Um, but after that, it was just kind of discarded. I, you know, went about my career, joined IBM, which is, you know, about the largest, uh, large an organization as, as it could be, especially like 12 years ago when, you know, before that hived off a whole bunch of departments. Um, but, uh, you know, at some stage I wanted to move into a 
sunrise industry, a, a nascent industry, and back then digital advertising was, you know, like really fairly new, you know, like growing rapidly, and you know, like everything that I read about it, I was really excited. Um, and uh, I ended up getting my first opportunity moving into the space with a startup, right? So uh, I joined a firm which was about uh, 40, uh, yeah, about 50 people strong at that point. And, uh, you know, like they brought me on board initially for process consulting, right? And they said, okay, you know, can you come on board? You have done obviously a lot of this over the course of your career. Um, you know, we'd like to help, uh, like you to help us with this because as we scale, we want those processes in place to begin with. Um, so I said, fine. And once I went there, right, you know, at first, at close quarters, when I was able to observe, um, you know, like what a startup looks like, uh, I was given, and I'll be thankful for this, uh, you know, I was given different positions of responsibility, which I'd never handled before. So they were willing to take a chance with me. Um, and during the course of that engagement, like about two and a half years, uh, I realized that I could actually run a firm if I wanted to, right? I, I actually built out a business unit, took it to, uh, you know, like built out a team, uh, you know, like went and closed clients, you know, like grew out a product. Uh, and I said, look, uh, at least in my head, the proof point was there that, yes, I know I'll need to do more as an entrepreneur, but I have much more confidence now that I'll be able to do it. Um, so, you know, like it, it's kind of, you know, both ways. So when I left campus, yes, the thought was in my head, but I set it aside thinking that I first want to figure out what I enjoy. I enjoyed, um, uh, you know, like online advertising, the digital space overall. And I said, okay, you know, like now if I have a thought or idea, I know that I would enjoy it. It's not just some hypothetical romantic concept in my head. It's something that I truly am passionate about. So whenever that opportunity comes, yeah, I'll be ready. Uh, and then the other part is, you know, going to a large organization versus a small one, right? So in a large organization, you get structure. In a smaller organization, you need to become adept at uh, organizing chaos, right? And and if you're able to do that, um, you know, then you have essentially, uh, you're, you're halfway there to, more than halfway there to being an entrepreneur. Um, so again, I mean, leaving, probably ending, uh, you know, this uh, <laughs> this little lecture with, with a little bit of advice is, uh, you know, like if, if someone wants to be an entrepreneur, uh, I, I always recommend, first of all, find what you want to do, right? And if possible, get some experience in that space so that you can actually get prepared for it, right? And it's not just that it looks rosy from the outside. You've seen it, you've been in the weeds and you actually know what it looks like. Uh, and the second thing is, if you have the opportunity, go work for a small company. Uh, you know, a startup, like less than 100 people, because that's where you're going to get positions of responsibility. That's where you're going to have direct line of sight to the founders. Uh, and so your learning uh, will be much, much more. Right? Um, and then I, I think you asked about, uh, you know, like, what was the spark to say, you know, like, I want to start something. And I mean, like, possibly part of that question was why data works. Uh, I felt that you know, like there's a lot of companies in the space, but um, in, in the space of digital advertising, but not many of them uh, were started with the perspective of helping the client. A lot of the companies in the space were started to, to basically go make money, right? And that's not a bad thing by itself. All businesses should make money and profit is a good motive. Um, but I, I felt there was an opportunity for a firm to be in there to provide value and at the same point of time, um, you know, like make money along the way. Right? So, so that kind of hopefully encapsulates my answer to that question. Yeah, Santa, that's really interesting that uh, like for many of us who are in the corp, will be working in the corporate and many of the islands who are currently working, like getting an experience first as uh, you're building a unit where you feel like you're working as an entrepreneur, getting those skills and then actually you get ready for the grind which maybe an, as an entrepreneur you need to do and uh, so and that's how you went about it uh, so if i were to ask like what were the when you started out uh, data works what were the initial two or three struggles you uh, two or three difficult things you would say you had to do and which took time for you to build upon yeah so i'd say look the first 
and most obvious thing is hiring right uh, who wants to take a chance on a company that has absolutely nothing right <laughs> you know like it's it's one of the most difficult things to do right so um, i'd say you need to be convinced about your vision you need to be clear about what you want to do that's the only the only reason why right? or that's only the the first step in convincing someone else that it's worth it for them to join your journey right and and make it their journey as well uh, so i'd i'd say that's probably just in the initial days one of the biggest things right uh, the second and i'd say this is more true for a first time entrepreneur uh, you know someone who's been through the grind once before it's probably not as much but there are so many smaller things that you need to deal with right everything from office space to um, you know maintaining accounts to making sure that you have all your statutory um, compliances in order right uh, it can be extremely overwhelming and you know not just in terms of getting it done but not knowing what you don't know right i mean if you have known unknowns you can go figure it out right and, and that's part of what an entrepreneur is supposed to do the bigger part is unknown unknowns right and and when those unknown unknowns are in these small tactical areas right where yes very clearly there are things to be done but you have no idea like you know 6 months later when you're talking to someone suddenly they say hey you know have you taken care of x or y and you say oh my god i hadn't even thought about it and i don't know if i'm in trouble now because i didn't do it earlier right so those are the to me those are the two biggest challenges especially for a first time entrepreneur um right so again make sure like for the first part like i said just have your conviction right don't start something for the sake of it you know like understand where you're going what's your vision um and for the second part i would strongly recommend you know like building a team of advisors right a lot of this you can't hire for and you can't be expected to know all the details uh, but what i've learned over time is that if you have the right set of advisors surrounding you whether it's so uh, you know a uh, ca or it's uh, uh, you know legal counsel or a company secretary right uh, these are all people that can guide you through the journey in the initial stages uh, and it's extremely important to have those trustworthy advisors like it's almost like having uh, a team of co-founders with you to or advisors you know like we have given equity to uh, to actually help you through this initial phase yeah i think the really two important takeaways from what you said conviction and having advisors to sail you through those uh, unknowns unknowns as you said and uh, how do you think this uh, it, it has become actually customary for us to ask this question because of the changing times we had uh, because of the covid how the conviction towards your business and also uh, because this must have been tested a lot during these times how did it benefit your business with respect to day to day operations and also maybe the changing times did it help in the uptake of digital marketing business how do you see going forward the future for the company in the change context yeah no it's uh, <laughs> i mean first of all it's you know it's really unfortunate what you know what the world has had to go through over the last year plus right it's more than a year tough to believe and unfortunately even more days to come before hopefully this is in the rear view mirror um you know along the way yes yeah, you know a larger organization has reserves of people of resources of uh, you know funds of clients you know so many different things uh at dataworks you know we were starting down that journey right you know finally kind of at a little bit of an inflection point and then um, it became uh, you know like when i think in april in march uh, you know like everyone started shutting down globally uh, in april almost all advertisers pulled their spend right they just said look we need to be careful we need to be cautious we don't know what's going to happen so we're just going to hold right and in april you know like frankly we had to make contingency plans we had to say okay what happens if you know things start going downwards um but what we also try to do is um you know keep up that communication um you know like with the entire leadership team obviously but uh, you know keep getting everyone's inputs but also with the entire organization and say look you know like 
we just want to be open that these are all the possibilities, right? We don't want to pull any triggers, but you know, this is how, you know, like if we need to do it, uh, this is what's going to happen. And we discuss various things in terms of, you know, salaries, in terms of, you know, trade-offs, you know, if, if people might need to take a temporary cut uh, and how they could be compensated in the future, right? So these are all things that we did to prepare in the initial days, right? When, when things were looking fairly bleak, I would say in the beginning of, calendar Q2 last year. Um, but over the course of uh, the year, right, what we saw is that there, you know, like we were able to actually go and close some new clients over that period. Uh, we, we were forced to innovate like our primary lead generation mechanism. Most of our clients are in the US, right? So our primary lead generation mechanism was, um, you know, going and running advertising uh, or sorry, marketing events. Uh, where you you know get close to close with people, you'd be able to speak. Uh, you know, people approach you. You you know they talk to you at a booth and so on, and that was suddenly wiped out. Right. So we we had to innovate and grow out our uh, our inside sales team. Uh, you know, figure out different ways of reaching out to potential clients so that we could uh, you know get back onto our growth trajectories. And the other thing you know, that really came home during that stretch was, um, hello? Uh, yes, Antul, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so the other thing that really came back, uh, uh, came home during that stretch is relationships, right? Uh, I, I told you a little bit about why we had started uh, Dataworks, right? And, you know, I'd wanted to start Dataworks because I felt there was that opportunity to provide value at the same time that you make money. Right. And, um, uh, you know, like a lot of our clients who had uh, where we had been working with them for, you know, four years, five years, six years, they actually came back where they whenever they had opportunity, like we would keep, you know, talking and, you know, like I would send some notes, you know, that might help them with their clients. Um, they pulled us into different conversations, to try and convince, um, you know, like so kind of we work with advertising agencies typically and they work with brands so we you know like that that constant conversation and and uh, flow of communication remained in fact it accelerated and and that's when you know like some of these relationships that you you spend a long time investing in you know like kind of trying to do the right thing not taking decisions on on an ad hoc tactical basis to look at short term gain but you know, long-term prosperity for both sides, you know, all of those things started coming back home, right? And and as we rounded out the year towards Q4, right, there was actually a growth that we started going through because, uh, you know, like a lot of our long-term clients started coming back and saying, hey, you know, there's this additional business to be had. Let's work on this. Let's close it out, right? And and let's jointly do a good job and, and make our joint clients successful. So I'd say that, uh, through the course of 2020, there was obviously a massive shock to the system. Um, but once that, once we went past that, we got back onto a growth trajectory. And you know, especially over I'd say the last uh, six to eight months, um, you know, we have, we have seen that there's been a fairly significant upswing for the business. Wow, that's uh, quite a quite a year you had then. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that you mentioned was that the value creation and you know the the system kind of paying back in a way to take care of uh, each other during the pandemic. I think that's that that's pretty interesting. You know, the the karma that paid off. Um, I mean, thanks, Anthil, for the insight. Uh, that's something that we hope most more people have. Uh, I think even in the year coming up, uh, let alone the year gone by, from the look of things. Uh, so I think. Given that we are in 2021, maybe it's a time to take a walk back down memory lane and reminisce about a time at PGPX. Uh, you know, like we all live with very distinct memories of what we liked here, what we disliked here. Can you just give a little insight into what your favorite subject was over here? Uh, marketing. So uh, I love the marketing courses, um, you know, like term one, term two, like my electives were all very marketing heavy. Um, what I realized a little bit when I, you know, went and joined IBM, like to me, like I graduated in 2009, right? And in 2009, uh, you really didn't have 
uh, many options, right? The the market had the bottom had fallen out of the market. Uh, you know, like Satyam had collapsed. The market was flooded with resumes. There were people from B schools around the world who you know like who had left from India to do their MBA who were all coming back because they didn't have visas, they didn't have jobs. Um, so it was the worst possible time to to graduate, right? But um, I actually at that point of time uh, got a job in IBM in marketing. I thought that's going to be the greatest thing for me. Uh, and there were definitely aspects of that that I liked and, and really enjoyed that. But um, what I also realized is that marketing cases are very different from marketing in an organization. Right? Marketing cases are about dealing with inflection points, uh, with dealing with crises. Right? Uh, what, what do you do in that situation? And yes, those things are going to come up every now and again. Um, but the day-to-day uh, can be a little bit different, right? It's it's a lot about tactical execution. Um, so in terms of the course that I like, courses that I liked, marketing, and still, if I'm back on campus, that's what I'd probably want to do, um, uh, you know, want to study and spend more time on. Uh, but I also realized that what you study and what you enjoy, uh, what, what you enjoy studying and what you enjoy doing need not necessarily be the same thing, right? You need to be careful about um, about translating immediately one to the other. Um, so uh, that's about the courses. Uh, you know, what did I enjoy on campus? What did I like? Uh, look, I, I loved the pressure, right? You know, like being, you know, going through that, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like an adrenaline rush and you become an adrenaline uh, junkie right, by the end of the year where you say, look, you know, I'm, I want these cases. I want to be able to go and study. I want to, you know, like put this together. I want to take on all the extracurricular work that I'm doing and constantly have that, that state of, uh, I'll call it, I'll coin a term and call it creative stress, right? Where, where you're pushing yourself and, and you're constantly trying to figure out how you can be better and how you can manage all of this. Uh, so, so that's, you know, like I, I'd say what I enjoyed the most about my time at IME. Uh, I mean, that's pretty, uh, you know, the, we were just reminiscing now that our year is coming to an end. We were thinking that uh, back when we came to IMM Bauth for the KT, for the, for the knowledge transfer, for the PGT expats, uh, we were doing, we were made to do cases till like, I think two in the morning. And a lot of people back then found it like, oh, this is oppressive. How, how can this be a day-to-day way of living? And <laughs> now it's all settled in so well. Uh, you know, I might have actually <laughs> trouble adjusting back to normal life when I get back out of this place. So creative stress, I think that that's a, that's a great term to, <laughs> uh, you know, take away from here. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's something, as you said, when, you know, in the initial phase, um, it's, you know, you're wondering why and how and <laughs> what are you going to do? Uh, you know, like, and, and then towards the end, you figure out, how to prioritize, right? And and what do you do first? What do you do next? What is the extent to which you need to do something to prep? Um, I will now that I'm off campus and all my grades are are already booked. I will <laughs> I will admit that there are uh, you know like probably my last couple of months with everything that was going on, you know, with placements and me being in placecom. I was getting into classes and in the first 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of the case discussion, I was figuring out what do we need to discuss, right? What are the key things that that are really going to, uh, you know, drive this case? And so being able to condense, you know, what was previously maybe two hours to three hours of preparation between theory and, uh, and, and case analysis into 15 to 20 minutes where you can quickly understand what's going on and be able to participate. Um, you know, that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's the skill set that professors <laughs> would encourage, but uh, but I'd say it's a skill set that uh, that actually helps you a lot in professional life, right, once you actually graduate and, and uh, you're outside campus. It was, I think, really great, Santhil, listening to your journey and really great insights for uh, everybody to take away. And thanks a lot for joining us and being there on uh, Beyond the Red Brick podcast. Yeah, lovely to be here. Great talking with both of you. Fantastic to be, uh, you know, associated with the campus, even if it's at the end of a a Zoom discussion. Uh, So, yeah.
Yeah, love uh, love the conversation. Uh, all the best to both of you for everything that you're going to do after you graduate and for the rest of your batch as well. Thanks, Anthal. I think given the pandemic, uh, you know, as they say, you never leave IMA <laughs> in, a, in a sense. Uh, we really hope to catch you around here again uh, sometime in the future once this thing just subsides. So thank you so much for being here. Again, from uh, the bottom of our hearts. Uh, thanks, Anthal, for the great discussion. Yeah, lovely joining you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye.